Good evening and welcome to our 6.30 uh, Bible study here at Lee Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, we are so glad that you have decided to tune in and have Bible study with us tonight. We know you have a multitude of choices when it comes to your Bible study and we are certainly glad that you have chosen to uh, come along with us on our journey uh, through the book of Acts on this particular night. Uh, we are giving God praise and thanksgiving for your presence tonight. And we invite you to uh, center yourself and allow God's word to speak to you, allow God's word to build you up, and allow God's word to educate you in the direction he'd have for your life. Uh, even though we're halfway through this day, uh, we still acknowledge that this is the day the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. We are in Acts chapter number 27, and tonight we'll be doing all 44 I know it's a lot of verses, but all 44 verses tonight, and I want to uh, take some time out and do a recap uh, with us uh, at some point, but right now, let us uh, go to God in prayer as we prepare ourselves for our Bible study tonight. Let us now go into prayer. Gracious God, we certainly thank you, Lord. We thank you, God, for watching over us as we slept last night. We thank you, Lord, for bringing us to this place uh, at this 6.30 time frame for our Bible study. God, we invite you into our homes. We invite you, Lord, into uh, wherever it is that we are watching this Bible study tonight. And God, we ask that you would continue to educate us. Continue, God, to uh, fill our minds and our, and our spirits and our souls and our bodies, God, with uh, your goodness, with your righteousness, and Lord, uh, with your knowledge. Bless us now, uh, O Lord, that as we go into our Bible study, you will reveal something to us that will help us along our way. This, O Lord, is our prayer in your Son, Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. All right, we are in Acts chapter number 27, and there is only one more chapter left. And so tonight, uh, and then our next Bible study meeting, you will have journeyed with us for the entire book of Acts. And I do indeed hope that as you have read and have studied these questions with us, that your spirit has grown. I do indeed hope that uh, your faith has increased, and I hope that you have had some questions answered about our text that we have read on these many weeks. All right, so Acts chapter 27, as we normally do, let me give a very brief recap of how we got to Acts 27 as we go through uh, the first 26 chapters of the book of Acts. Acts opens up uh, with Jesus having a conversation with the disciples and reminding them of the promise of the Holy Spirit coming into their lives and how much uh, needed they would need the Holy Spirit. We will see as they go through their journey in the book of Acts. Acts starts us off with the disciples, of course, uh, being concerned about what their future is. And, and how they might carry out their lives in light of the fact that even though Jesus has ascended from the dead, there are still those who don't believe he has, and there are those who would like to persecute uh, those who are preaching about this resurrected Jesus. And so there's some hesitancy on the part of the disciples, and Jesus gives them encouragement to indeed go out and to proclaim his name. One particular instance is where Jesus instructs Peter that on the day of Pentecost, uh, during this Pentecost festival, uh, that he wants Peter to preach a sermon uh, centered around uh, his life and his death and his resurrection so that others may come to believe that they too can have life after death. When Peter preaches, uh, the miracle that occurs is that you had persons who were adherents to Judaism from all over the world who had been speaking their own language that they had grown up to speak from different parts of the world, this time able to hear in their own language the good news of Jesus Christ as Peter was proclaiming it in his own language. And so the beauty was they heard in another language about God, and after this, so many people uh, joined the church, and this, of course, upset uh, the religious leaders of the city, but Peter and the disciples were encouraged by Jesus to continue to proclaim his goodness and uh, the uh, ad adventurous um, nature of their journey began to take from right there because indeed it became an adventure uh, because they soon ran across a man who was crippled and unable to walk. 
and Peter and John saw him at this gate called Beautiful, and he was begging for, for money, for silver or for gold or for any items that had value that he might be able to uh, buy himself something to eat and, and buy some clothes and, and enlarge himself. But Peter and John said, listen, uh, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have is this message of salvation through Jesus Christ. And we encourage you in that spirit to rise from your, from your place and to walk. And at that instance, his legs began to sure up, his ankles began to become strengthened, and he indeed walked. Well, when the people of the city saw this, they were amazed because they knew how infirmed this man had been. And when they saw this miracle, they said, listen, this surely must be a message full of power uh, if it could heal this man's body and if it could strengthen him in his legs and if it could turn his life around. And many people joined God's church after that. Well, this again upset the religious leaders of that city and they brought Peter and John before the council and they again said, listen, you all cannot keep uh, proclaiming uh, this Jesus whom we know is not alive, but Peter and John said, no, uh, he is alive, and they prayed for boldness, and God gave them indeed boldness and allowed them to continue to go and to proclaim his goodness to those who were willing to hear it. As we go forward in Acts chapter number 6, we recall, we recall that uh, Peter and the disciples, because so many people had joined the church, um, their work was becoming overrun, and they were not able to attend to the needs of uh, the widows and the orphans as they had previously done. And this was you know, making sure that they did not suffer any type of lack, which was the promise uh, that was given toward the beginning of the start of God's church. But they did uh, fall by the wayside with some of their duties. And so led by the Holy Spirit, they created this new level of ministry called deacons. And of course, this was an area where persons could specifically focus on the day-to-day -day needs of the church, the members, allowing for the elders to then be able to focus on uh, the uh, preaching ministry and focus on bringing more people into God's kingdom. And one of the first ones chosen to serve was a man named Stephen. And the Bible says that God's spirit was powerful uh, in Stephen, and, and he was able to go out and do many good works. Unfortunately, his boldness was not what the people wanted to see. And so one day they surrounded Stephen and they began to ask him many questions. And as it ended, uh, Stephen was being stoned. And one particular person that was there when Stephen was being stoned was a man named Saul, who was very much uh, part of those who persecuted the Christians, persecuted the disciples and sought ways to kill them. Uh, this man, Saul, uh, was in this position of trying to also persecute more Christians. And, and one day, he was on his way to a place called Damascus, where he was seeking to get permission to go and track down more Christians and persecute them for their proclaiming of Jesus being alive. On his way to Damascus, the Bible says that uh, he was uh, knocked off of his horse by a bright light coming down from heaven. And when he got up off of his horse, uh, the voice from the, the, the heavens said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? To which Saul replied, who are you? And Jesus responded by saying, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. At this instance, Paul was immediately struck with the fact that he had been doing the very wrong thing, that he had been persecuting a very well alive uh, Savior, Jesus the Christ. And of course, at this instant, Paul said, listen, you know, what do I have to do to put forth your message? And so Jesus said, you must go and study for a while with the disciples, and uh, you're going to be blinded for a while because you need to be led by them as they give instruction. Of course, Saul was concerned because he didn't think that they would take him seriously. Uh, the disciples were concerned because they knew that Saul was, a one, uh, was one who had been killing them. And so it was because of Jesus uh, giving them both instruction about the others that would need help that uh, Ananias was able to heal Paul's eyes and allow Paul to be able to see. While this was happening, a man named Cornelius, who was a Gentile or a non-Jewish 
person was having a vision from God about Peter coming and proclaiming God's good news to him and his family. Uh, at a similar time, uh, the Bible says that Peter uh, fell into a trance and saw coming down in his vision a, a sheet with four corners that was filled with all kind of food that he had never eaten before. And when the voice of God said to him to get up and kill and eat, uh, Peter said, Lord, no, this I've never done. I've never eaten any of this food, and I don't want to defile myself. And God said to him, what I have now declared as clean and good, you shall not call unclean. This vision to Peter was to symbolize the fact that formerly uh, the Gentiles had been excluded from the message of salvation, but now they would be included. And so what was formerly excluded would now be included. So Peter got up and was directed to go meet Cornelius, and Cornelius was instructed to receive Peter when he arrived. So when Peter arrived uh, in, in Joppa and met Cornelius, they both exchanged the visions and dreams that they had had, and they both realized that God was working through each of them to identify the other one to bring about uh, this wonderful act of salvation. So Peter proclaimed the good news of Jesus Christ to Cornelius and his entire family, and they were all uh, accepted into God's church, and they received the Holy Spirit and salvation. Well, the Bible says that now that uh, Saul has been trained in the ministry of Jesus and is ready to go out and proclaim the good news, he changes his name to Paul. And, and, and Barnabas and, and Paul are going into places like Antioch and proclaiming God's good news, and they are uh, telling folks about the salvation that is available to them if they would just believe in Jesus. And the Bible says that everywhere that Paul and Barnabas went, they were able to convert a good number of people. In one particular instance, uh, there was a situation where uh, Paul was uh, trying to convince people to believe in, uh, believe in God, and he saw a lot of statues that they had erected to other gods. These gods had different names on them, and one particular statue had this inscription, to the unknown or unnamed God. Well, the people in that particular town were, to, were trying to be very careful in particular to make sure that they did not overlook anybody's name or not worship anybody. And so Paul said to them, listen, you all have even a statue to an unnamed God. He said, all these gods you have lined up, they all do not equal the one and true living God because none of them are alive. They are all not alive. They are nothing more than the stone that they are carved into or the wood they have carved out of. He said, but I want to bring to you this message of a true and living God, the God of Israel, who made you who brought salvation into your life through the death of his son, Jesus the Christ. At this learning, the people uh, rejoiced, and they began to follow Jesus. Well, this upset the artisans in that city who had been making all these uh, statues and were selling them to the people. And they began to uproar in the city that Peter, I'm sorry, that Paul was disrupting the work that was going on. And at this instance, what happened was Paul and Silas, after several attempts to bring salvation to people, were put into prison. The Bible says that uh, the Holy Spirit came to Paul and, and Silas and opened the door for them to escape. Uh, when the guard heard this, he knew surely that they had gone and that his life was going to end because he had not kept watch over them. And Paul cried out to him and said, listen, uh, don't fret, we are still in here. So the, the, the soldier came in and said, I'm amazed at the fact that you're still here. And Paul began to talk to him about God. And the soldier said, what must, well asked rather, what must I do to be saved? And so even in prison, Paul was able to convert uh, some people to believe in Jesus. Well, as we go forward, uh, Paul goes to places like Corinth, places like Athens, places like Ephesus. And then Paul uh, gets pursued by some of the religious leaders and some of the artisans from other cities because they want to uh, destroy his ministry. And so this is what starts this long trial where the religious leaders of that city accused Paul of disrupting the peace in that city, and then those who were left in charge had to start to deal with Paul and these accusations. And so Paul uh, first starts with Felix, uh, the governor, and, and Felix is corrupt, and wants Paul to give him some money 
uh, to escape from the prison, but Paul doesn't do that. He's then uh, brought before uh, Festus, the emperor, uh, and then he's later brought before the king, Agrippa, uh, because Paul asserted his Roman citizenship and demanded a fair trial. And so as he is being defending himself all along the way, finally, each one says, listen, he has done nothing wrong, but because he has appealed to go before the emperor, we must sit him, uh, send him rather to the emperor, which is where we find ourselves in Acts chapter number 27. All right, I know that was a lot. Thank you for bearing with me as we went through all of that. Let us prepare now to read Acts chapter number 27 in its entirety as we prepare for our lesson tonight. When it was decided that we were to sail for Italy, they transferred Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion of the Augustan cohort named Julius. Embarking on a ship of Admatium that was about to set sail to the ports along the coast, coast of Asia, we put to sea accompanied by Aristarchus, a Macedonian from Thessalonica. The next day we put in at Sidon and Julius treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends to be cared for. Putting out to sea from there, we sailed under the lee of Cyprus because the winds were against us. After we had sailed across the sea that is off of Cilicia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra and Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship bound for Italy and put us on board. We sailed slowly for a number of days and arrived with difficulty at Cnidus. And as the wind was against us, we sailed under the lee of Crete of Salmon. Sailing past it with difficulty, we came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lycia. Since much time had been lost and sailing was now dangerous, because even the fast had already gone by, Paul advised them, saying, Sirs, I can see that the voyage will be with danger and much heavy loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Since the harbor was not suitable for spending the winter, the majority was in favor of putting to sea from there on the chance that somehow they would reach Phoenix where they, would, where they could spend the winter. It was a harbor of Crete facing southwest and northwest. When a moderate south wind began to blow, they thought they could achieve their purpose. So they weighed anchor and began to sail past Crete close to the shore. But soon a violent wind called the Northeaster rushed down from Crete. Since the ship was caught and could not be turned head on into the wind, we gave way to it and were driven. By running under the lee of a small island called Calda, we were scarcely able to get the ship's boat under control. After hoisting it up, they took measures to undergird the ship. Then, fearing that they would run on the Sirtis, they lowered the sea anchor and so were driven. We were being pounded by the storm so violently that on the next day, they began to throw the cargo overboard. And on the third day, with their own hands, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest raged, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and thereby avoided this damage and loss. I urge you now to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For last night there stood by me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor. And indeed, God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we will have to run aground on some island. When the 14th night had come, as we were drifting across the Sea of Adria, 
About midnight, the sailors suspected that they were nearing land. So they took soundings and found 20 fathoms. A little farther on, they took soundings again and found 15 fathoms. Fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. But when the sailors tried to escape from the ship and had lowered the boat into the sea on the pretext of putting up anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the boat and set it adrift. Just before daybreak, Paul urged all of them to take some food, saying, today is the 14th day that you have been in suspense and remaining without food, having eaten nothing. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will help you survive, for none of you will lose a hair from your heads. After he had said this, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then all of them were encouraged and took food for themselves. We were in all 276 persons in the ship. After they had set, satisfied their hunger, they lightened the ship by throwing the wheat into the sea. In the morning, they did not recognize the land, but they noticed a bay with a beach on which they planned to run the ship ashore if they could. So they cast off the anchors and left them in the sea. At the same time, they loosened the ropes that tied the steering oars, then hoisting the foresail to the wind, they made for the beach. But striking a reef, they ran the ship aground. The bow struck and remained immovable, but the stern was being broken up by the force of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that none might swim away and escape. But the centurion, wishing to save Paul, kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land, and the rest to follow, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship, and so it was that all were brought safely to land. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and doers of his most holy word. Amen. All right. So as we gather every Wednesday, it is my hope always that we learn something more about the um, character of God or something more about the human condition or something more about the particular text that we are reading. And I hope that is what we'll get out of the lesson tonight. All right, we're in Acts chapter 27. Let us jump straight into our questions here and gain some more understanding from what we are reading tonight. First question that will help us out with this text is this. What gave Paul peace during the storm? What gave Paul peace during the storm? Keep in mind that Paul is being uh, sailed from where he is to Italy, uh, to Rome, to go before the emperor. But along the way, the Bible says that several times uh, there were storms in the sea and everybody was afraid of what was going to happen. But Paul had some peace. All right, let us find verse number 22 and see if we can discover why Paul had peace. Look at where, verse 22 and it says this. I urge you now to keep up your courage for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For last night there stood by me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor. And indeed, God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. Paul had an assurance. Uh, God had revealed himself through this visitation of the angel to say to Paul, you must stand before the emperor and there will be no loss of life but the ship will be destroyed and notice what paul's words here are paul says an angel of the god to whom i belong those are powerful words the god to whom i belong and whom i worship symbolically this journey of Paul's and this ship being tossed in the storm can be equated to issues we have in our own lives. Storms that we oftentimes describe them are issues in our lives, whether it is a financial storm, whether it is a health storm, uh, if it is a family relationship storm, if it is a career storm, 
if it is an emotional storm. These are times when our ship or our life or our direction is not sailing smoothly, but is being pushed upon by outside forces, is being pressed upon by things we can't control. But notice what Paul gives us as a nugget. The God to whom I belong and whom I worship. I want you to get something deeply anchored in your soul. You belong to God. If you have confessed a saving grace in Jesus Christ, you belong to God. And you worship God. You give him praise. You give him thanksgiving. You, you adore him and you thank him for what he's done. If you belong to God, this same God to whom you belong also makes this promise to you that the storms that you go through, the storms in your life, will not destroy you. There will be some loss of some things, but you will not be destroyed. And I want to encourage you with that word tonight because it may seem as if we have been in a storm of epic proportions since March of 2020, but I guarantee you, you will survive this storm. You will make it out of this storm. Yes, you may lose some things. We all lose things in storms, but we have also this assurance that we will survive, that we will make it out, that we will be okay. The three Hebrew boys, when they were uh, looking at this burning furnace full of fire uh, that they were supposed to be tossed into, they said to King Nebuchadnezzar, we will not worship you. We will not bow down to you and give you any praise because our praise only belongs to our God to whom we belong. And if he chooses to rescue us, then we praise him for that. But even if he doesn't, we still won't worship you because either way, we are still going to be set free by our God. And that's the mindset that we have to get inside of us that is the perspective we have to take. That even if God does not answer our prayers the way that we want them answered, that even if God does not bring about our deliverance the way that we want him to bring it about, we still will be delivered by God. We still will be uh, released from our prisons by God. We still will have a saving situation brought to us by God. And so I want you to get this in your spirit because just as Paul had peace, you and I can have peace in the storms of our life, knowing that, yes, we may lose some things, but God will bring us through those storms. Second question, what gave the other people on the ship comfort? Now, they didn't worship God, and so we must ask the question, but what gave them some comfort? Look at verses 34 through 36. Verse 34, here is Paul talking to the people on the ship. Therefore, I urge you to take some food, for it will, be help, it will help you survive, for none of you will lose a hair from your heads. After he said this, he took bread and giving thanks to God in the presence of all, he broke it and began to eat. Then all of them were encouraged and took food for themselves. Paul had to set an example for them. They were encouraged and had comfort because Paul displayed comfort in front of them. He made his speech, but then he showed them that he had peace by sitting down and saying, listen, you need to eat some food because it'll help you survive. Well, if you think you're going to die on the ship, you might ask the question, well, what good is it going to do for me to eat? I'm going to die anyway. But Paul says, no, you're going to survive, so go ahead and eat because after this ship is destroyed, you need to be able to swim to the sea you need, I'm through the sea to the shore. You need to be able to paddle a boat to the shore, or you may need to float on something to the shore. But however you get there, when you get there, you will need strength in your body to survive after the ship is destroyed. So Paul gave them comfort by displaying to them his faith. As we talked Sunday about burying talents, right? One of those talents could be our faith. One of those talents could be our hope. And so when trouble comes, we don't need to bury our hope and our faith because others who might not have our hope and our faith are watching us to
to see how we respond to situations that come into our lives. And so I want to encourage you in difficult situations, display the peace that you have in God. Assure others that you believe that things are going to be okay because it is going to be your faith that assures them that everything's going to be okay. I can't tell you how many times as a young man I looked up to my parents when trouble came and because of their faith and their confidence, I knew things were going to be okay. When lightning was striking outside and the thunder was outside and the power in the house went off, my father and mother would, would, would find a, a flashlight or a, a candle and light it and come to my room and get us out of our beds and they would assure us everything's going to be okay. And they would guide my sisters and myself to a place where we could be safe and understand, yes, the power is off. Yes, the wind is blowing. Yes, the rain is beating down on the house. But we are okay. And that confidence that they gave us gave us assurance so that we could live off of their faith. And so I want to encourage you, live out your faith and your peace so that others can be encouraged by what they see in you. Third and final question, how did the people make it safely to dry land? Paul was reassured that the ship might not make it, but the people would. So how did the people make it safely to dry land? The Bible talks about the fact that they laid down their anchors and they thought they were going to be okay, but as the waves began to push the ship against the rocks uh, near the land, the ship began to break up and they had to find a way off of the ship. Verse 43 and 44 says this, But the centurion wishing to save Paul kept them from carrying out their plan. He ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make it for the land, and the rest to follow, some on planks and others on pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought safely to land. This also gives us an image of the fact that everybody may not have the capacity to escape from the situation in the same manner. Everybody doesn't have the same strength. Those who can, jump off the ship and swim under your own power. Those who cannot, grab a plank and float to the land. Even still others, if you don't have a plank, grab a little bit of a piece of the ship. In other words, what we find in what the centurion is saying to them is what God is also saying to us. As you are delivered from your situation, keep in mind, everybody will not have the same capability. Some folks have more faith. Some folks have more to hold on to. Some folks have more resilience. And so you may see somebody who doesn't have the kind of strength you have. When you see that, Help them in their journey. The next time it may be you. You may be the one who can't jump from the ship and swim. And you need a little bit more help. And so as we evaluate how people respond to tragedy, we must also be empathetic. For example, you may experience death in your family. And you may be able to cope with it better than somebody else in the family. You need to be able to encourage them as they cope a little bit differently than you. You may experience job loss, and you may you know, lose your job and have the faith and hope that God is going to make sure everything's going to be all right, and you may apply for the job very quickly and know that God is going to watch out for you, and you have that assurance. But somebody else may need a little bit more assurance as they deal with their job loss because they may need a little bit more faith and hope placed in them. And so I want to encourage you that that everybody does not move at the same speed as everybody else. Everyone doesn't have the same faith level that you have. And so let's encourage people in their own journey, in their own way, to make it through their difficulties. All right, so that's our lesson for tonight. I want to encourage you, uh, as you read Acts 27 again, uh, that God indeed will make sure that whatever difficulty you find yourself in, that you will survive. All right? Uh, Please join us, if you can, uh, Thursday for our prayer call. That's tomorrow. Saturday for our 
Sunday school on Saturday. Our church schools are at 9 a.m. Uh, and 10 a.m. And also for worship on Sunday at 10 a.m. All right. We invite you to join us for those activities. May God bless you and may God keep you. Is my prayer until next time.